This is the lecture for how to shoot video that doesn't suck part one. This <clears throat> summarizes the first part of the book into two different lectures where I cut the first, basically the first hundred pages of the book or so into two different lectures. This is part one. Um, I'm just going to jump right in. This, this kind of cuts into several different areas uh, and I basically just break down different chapters into different slides and throw some other pointers in there and this is what I think is important for the midterm and these are things that we'd be discussing <clears throat> in uh, in class if we hadn't lost that week to Isaac, but it's these are still things you should be thinking about as you work through the assignments uh, one through five. So we're going to um, go through this, takes about 15 or 20 minutes, and hopefully we'll have time to discuss it in class because this one is kind of an important summary of everything. The first lesson is uh, when you go out shooting to think um, like you are editing in the camera. This is a big time saver that I haven't had time to address in class yet. But what it basically means is you shoot sequences in the order in which you want to cut them, if at all possible. And you basically just you know shoot those 10 second shots and let the camera steady so that if you really needed to crash edit, you could just go through all those clips <clears throat> in your event and just grab three seconds and push E to slam it at the end and then go to the next clip, grab three or four seconds and push E to put it at the end and your, your whole sequences would make sense because you would have a steady shot of a close-up of typing and then a steady shot of maybe a wider shot of a person at a desk and then a steady shot of a medium angle uh, just with more typing. Uh, if you cut those three studies together, you have a sequence and you don't have to think too much about it. It can really speed up your work on the editing end if you do your job. <coughs> Pardon me. If you do your job on the shooting end. So you want to shoot short shots. You want to shoot at least 10 seconds long, but you're going to cut those down to be shorter shots. Um, and what you're really doing is breaking processes down. Um, you know, the example in class was typing an email, and basically you took something that might take somebody five minutes and you summed it up in about 10 seconds. Um, if you wanted to get really into it, you could show the person you know, opening the email program or the web browser where they write emails and then typing the uh, the two the address label uh, for the email and then you know cut to a close-up of them typing some more and then get out to a wide shot of them at their desk and then maybe uh, go to a close-up of them hitting send and then you've broken the process down into five shots and it probably will take you uh, 15 seconds or 20 15 or 20 seconds uh, to tell a story that probably took somebody five or ten minutes in real life to do. So your rule, shoot ten second shots, cut it down to three to five seconds. Sequences should be three or four or more shots. Sometimes you can put together big sequences of a lot of shots, but usually in news we just do three or four shots in a row. You gotta focus your shots. This doesn't just mean keep the shots in focus. I mean obviously you're gonna do that. Uh, you want to have a hero for every shot. <clears throat> That's something that people have brought up in class, and I'm glad to see it. Uh, you know, I'm glad to see that popping up at least in discussion where people have uh, demonstrated their understanding the real basics of the text. Um, every shot has the potential to sell to tell a subject, verb, and possibly an object story. That was in the last lecture. I'm just reiterating it here because it comes up in the book a couple of times. Um, you want to use subject, verb, object construction in your writing, but if you think about it, each shot could have uh, a hero doing something, taking some action. All right, play with your equipment. You need to know the following functions <clears throat> of the camera. Where's the, where's the power button? Where do you put the SD card? How, uh, where are the two buttons to record and stop recording? Uh, you need to know how to uh, use the manual iris wheel and how it, you know that wheel is also a button, so you push it in to uh, uh, make it automatic or to make it manual, and then you adjust it. Uh, and I think there's a release switch that's in front of it. We can go over that again if you want to, but you should know how to manually open up the iris and bring in more light uh, uh, or close it off so there's less light. And you should know where the zebra uh, monitor is so you can uh, keep track of how much light is getting into your, uh, to your shot. Obviously, there are a couple places, uh, <coughs> excuse me, there are a couple of um, uh, buttons on the camera that handle zoom, a couple little servos, um, one by your hand. Uh, if you have your thumb on the on off button, then there's one right by your uh, index finger. Use index and middle finger, and there's also one on the top handle of the camera. Obviously, uh, you should know how to use the white balance. Uh, on most cameras, it's pretty easy now. You just uh, 
hold it all the way in and wait till the screen goes to black and let it cycle through and it'll set the white balance. It's most important to do at the beginning of a shoot and then if you go into a different light source and then if you go outside or inside you've got to adjust the white balance. And you want to know the basic audio setups for interviews and for b-roll on the camera. We'll have like a whole lecture on dealing with microphones so for now this is what I want you to know with regard to the camera. When it comes to editing, these are the steps. This is oversimplified, I know. There's a lot that goes into it, but uh, in these uh, three, six, nine steps, this is basically how you put together a video news package. So we're going all the way into the package process here. Uh, hook your hard drive up before you log in. You open Final Cut Pro X and select your My Home HD and you start an event. Then you import your video. Now you've seen how to do all that a couple of times before. You log your best shots and your best sound bites when we're doing interviews a little bit later in the semester. Then you go over to a word processor and you write a script. I'm going to provide templates for you, but you write a script that's about and it covers about a 90 second package. You've got to voice that script. You can use the camera if you still got it, or you can walk over to the voicing booth uh, right across from the lab on our fourth floor. Uh, and then you can open up a project inside of your event and you edit using that script. So the script is the guideline. Uh, you, you lay down your reporter track and then sound bite and then reporter track and then sound bite and you line up all of those <clears throat> in one layer of your um, of your project which I'm gonna still call a timeline from time to time. But you lay all that down the bottom in that project and then you go back through and you input b-roll covering up all of the reporter tracks because until you cover up that reporter track it's either black or it's gonna be video of you um, well it's either gonna be black video or if you use your camera it might be just video of the you know classroom or something so I'll explain this all I know it's a lot to take in at once but the basic idea is that you put down you put down the narrative line with audio first with the reporter telling the story and the sound bites uh, either reiterating facts or bringing some emotion to the story or telling some very specific event, uh, some very like specific sound bite that might be descriptive if it's something that only an interview subject can explain. And then you go back and you B-roll so your B-roll matches the video. There's going to be a, a definite pacing and a cadence to your voice and everybody talks a little bit differently and if you edit video to the way you talk then it's it's going to really it's going to be paced really well. You'll be able to, you know, edit to the ups and to the downs, uh, and you'll be able to make sure you're matching exactly what you're saying, at least to the best of your ability. And hopefully, you shot everything that you're talking about. Editing is about pacing. On paper, the script is going to look something like this: you have a little well, nat sound open, a nat sound bite, uh, a sequence of cars driving through the woods, while the reporter says, "Drivers in West Baltimore encountered deep waters during recent rains." And you just go continue, continue, continue with uh, uh, reporter tracks like that and sound bites like this. Uh, I can't, I couldn't remember a specific sound bite from the pack, so I just wrote someone named Jane Doe saying it's really bad. It's a lot higher than I thought. Uh, you just we'll go back and forth, reporter track, the thing that's in all caps here, uh, and sound bites, and throw in some nat sound here and there, and even a little nat sound bite where you didn't have the person mic'd up. Maybe you just kind of had the camera close to them and you got it off the nap mic but you get a couple words here and there and that really speeds up the pace and keeps the thing moving and that's what we're going for all right you've got to shoot with your feet so we've talked about talked about editing talked about the process my hope for you is that you save this lecture and you refer to the key parts uh, you know take notes refer to the key parts when you're actually editing and obviously this is all going to come back up in a midterm, but the whole point of the midterm is just so you can think, you know, cognitively process the things that you're actually doing in class. So we can get into some of the, um, you know, theoretical implications of these things and some of the implications of uh, image framing in other classes. I'm sure I'll have a couple of questions about, um, you know, the meaning of everything you're doing and what you're trying to communicate to audiences and what it means that uh, you're telling them a news story. But for now, let's just focus on uh, getting the videos cut and done and uh, looking as good as possible, sounding as good as possible. All right, so speaking of getting your shots looking good, you got to shoot with your feet. 
when you watch professional videographers in the field, they're usually called photogs, even at TV stations. You see a photog running around at a scene, they're like tripod jockeys. They're carrying the tripod over here, setting it up, getting a shot, carrying it over here, setting it up, getting a shot, and then they'll take the camera off the tripod, <clears throat> and they'll get some low angles. Um, maybe they'll uh, set it on top of a desk or something and get some, you know, um, some shots that way or set it on top of a, if there's a, sometimes there's a countertop or something or a table, depending on where the shoot is happening. Um, but they're always carrying around tripods and they're always setting them up in a relative hurry and they're always changing angles. So shoot and move. Um, a good, a good rule of thumb is to shoot an establishing shot and then go ahead and zoom in and shoot a closer up shot from that same position. And then you can move to a new angle to shoot your medium shot. Uh, and maybe move again and get a super close up. And so that way you can cut from the wide shot to that other angle, medium shot, back to the close up that you got from your first position, and then be back <clears throat> back in for a super close up if you got that. It's a good idea to get a, a couple of shots from each angle and then cut back and forth between the two so you're not making a bunch of pop cuts. Uh, three basic levels to shoot from or think about um, your own eye, you know, the way the way you actually look at things. Shoot from the eye, shoot from the hip, shoot from below, shoot from like the, the ground level. Um, people usually see the world from their own eye level or from a seated position, which is about the hip level. Uh, and you don't always obviously lay on the ground and look at events, but when you're when you're walking and looking across a horizon, you know, you still kind of see things from a low angle. Uh, and it's a good way sometimes to just vary shots and to, you know, really get the camera up close to things. It's usually... Uh, that's, you know, the close-ups are a lot of times when you're shooting from below. So here's an example. Uh, obviously the one on the left is shot from below and it's a shot of, you know, a low angle shot looking up at a dog. We got a medium shot which is really good color and pretty good light on this kid. I don't know what he's doing. He's standing outside of a farmhouse obviously. But that's a medium shot. And then the high angle shot, if you're going to look down on a little piglet, you have to put the camera up on a tripod and angle, tilt it down. Okay? So low angle on the left, middle in the middle, and high angle on the right. Okay, get up close and personal. The textbook says don't shoot until you see the whites of their eyes, but this is really key. Um, I've been helping a family member edit some old home videos, and the tendency is generally to zoom all the way out and get a shot of a whole room, like one whole room at a time. Here's the living room, and we're going to pan across, and there'll be like four people walking through the shot, and doing different things you can almost it's almost hard to tell who's who um well part of it's because two of my cousins are twins and I can never tell who's who but if you actually get up close and you get and you see the faces of the people you know you need to get close enough to really see the whites of their eyes that means you have their face in view so get shots of people I'm really sick of seeing b-roll of rooms and b-roll of art I mean yeah somebody made that art so either show me somebody looking at it or somebody painting it I don't want to see just <clears throat> static posters on the wall or paintings on the wall. So shooting people means getting shots of faces. Set a shot and hold it. The way I always talk about it is to compose a still shot um, as though you're capturing a portrait and then you just let that portrait come to life. This is a decent two shot sequence. I put it in here because this is the allowable amount of shake. There's a little bit of shake in this video. That's kind of from somebody uh, probably hitting the record, record stop button. And it doesn't bug me. I would not say this is so bad that it you know makes the story fail. It's, it's not, I don't think I'd, you know, for just these two shots, I wouldn't, if it were like that throughout the entire, entire video, maybe. But these two shots would survive, um, you know, my test of whether or not the story is professional. And look at it again. This is a good close-up, right? Got two hands working on the harp. The light is really good. The color is really good. You can see all the different colors in the wood. You can see kind of some dust, different color strings. Um, you can see how the light kind of lands on the, on the woman's or the girl's hands. Uh, you can see these picks that she has taped to her fingers. I mean, that's cool. You can see all these details if you just kind of freeze the, freeze the frame, uh, and that's because they, they just got a pretty decent close-up. Play it one more time. And the action almost matches. That's another clue I'm going to teach you and try to do it in great detail. But when you see somebody doing a you know playing a whole musical performance, you want to break that. 
uh, event down. You want to break that process down. And so this is what we do for people. We save them time so they don't have to watch the whole event. But they still want to see it and hear it. So she's kind of pulling across the strings in the first shot, and she's pulling across the strings. Obviously, it's a different point in the song, but it's close enough that it matches. See how the left hand is moving down the strings? Boop, boop. Pretty good match, all right? Go for stuff like that. I will be elated, and I will definitely overlook a little bit of shake in the video. This, oh my god, this is one that looks like everybody's, <laughs> just about everybody's first video. They go out, <clears throat> they're so nervous just to get shots that they shoot something like this. This is too much tilt and too much pan, and I'll just show it to you. I'll, I'll critique it at the end, but if you bring this back, I'm going to say go go reshoot it, or God help you, I hope you got some steady shots in there, uh, enough to cover a 90-second package, because this is not so much. Use, and then I'm a satellite exhibition I'm over here. And I like to kind of push the boundaries um, and go beyond just traditional painting. Oh, really? You push the boundaries? You're the only artist to ever do that. Painting and photography, as you can probably see. <laughs> Oh God. Okay, so we've got like every cliche in the book here. We've got an unmotivated tilt. There's no reason to be tilting and panning. We've got a person walking through the shot just at the beginning for no apparent reason. What's she doing? She's not even really in the shot, but she's in the shot. <clears throat> There's no steady shot here. Then we have a nap bite, but it's just dumped into the B-roll for no apparent reason. There's a sound bite here. It's a nat it's off the natural sound mic, but what is she even talking about? I don't know. It doesn't really, you shouldn't have people talking as though it were an interview in your b-roll we call that lip flap it's basically just a, a person who's like if we turn the sound down a little bit there's a person but she's not really being interviewed but her mouth is moving and so people are going to be distracted they're going to say what is she talking about what is she saying is that a sound bite if it's not why am i looking at it so no lip flap or i will kick it right back to you fail it right away Satellite exhibition, I'm over here. And I like to kind of push the boundaries. This shot also does a thing I call searching. It's like, there would be a steady shot here, and it would probably be the person pointing at the schedule of the events of upcoming art shows. Uh, but they're searching for a shot, so the camera just kind of tilts down across the whole thing. And then I'm a satellite exhibition, I'm over here. And I like to kind of push the boundary. Okay, so and that's a bite that's in there. If, if that were in B-roll, it would be wrong, because it would be lip flap. As a bite, it's kind of whatever. And then some more... Just crappy B-roll. Well, it, I'm one oriented person. Uh, beaded spot is where we are right now. So the colors are decent, and these shots are kind of steady. So you can see at some point they tried to take uh, lessons from the book and get some close-ups. But this is close-up after close-up after close-up, and it's actually different painting, different painting, different painting. You're not giving me a wide view of this painting to show how it's <clears throat> a bunch of puzzle pieces and then zooming in on a little bit closer spot. It's just different artwork, different artwork, different artwork, and it's really uh, it's really hard to follow. So this is what not to do. Do not copy this. Do not do anything like this. Okay? Okay. So this is an example of when it's okay to move the camera. If you're moving with action, it's okay to pan across. If there are things that are rolling across a stage in your shot, that's okay to move the camera. I don't like it as because it's a jump cut from where this guy is sitting down or kind of bending over and then here he is jumping into the thing. You want to change angles before you get those two shots. But this is okay in terms of this first shot. Uh, it is a motivated pan. There's a reason to pan. Yeah, I would take the middle shot out, and you could use the first and last shot, and it wouldn't fail. As it is, it's a, it's a fail. It's not ready to go yet. Okay, uh, you want to see the light when you're shooting. The difference between a story passing as professional and not, it has to do with the way you use the light. You've got to, your subject has to be well lit. It can be from natural light, or it can be from lights that you set up, <clears throat> but you got to think of yourself as a documentarian. Uh, lighting, you know, m more often than not, you're using the natural, either the lights in the room or the sunlight to light your, um, you know, whatever you're shooting. And you can, you just have to think of yourself, if you were a filmmaker, you know, where would you put the light source? And then 
you know, what falls within that light source that you can actually get shots of. And so it is possible to think of yourself as actually working on a film set, you know, setting up a shot. Uh, you obviously don't have a crew of 15 people to help you set up a shot. It's just you. But it is possible to think of it as, you know, meaningful construction of a shot with the light being where you want it to. So it is possible to have a well-lighted set. Um, a lot of it rely a lot of it depends on if you get there early enough um, to get good sunlight or if you get there in time to uh, you know figure out where the light is coming from and where the light is going and you know I'm not against you turning on better looking lights in the room if there's fluorescence everywhere but they also have other lights you can have them turn on other lights and you obviously bring a top light for when things get too dark you can put that camp get that light on top of your camera um, <clears throat> It's not considered staging to turn a light on things. It's really not. It's really just a question that people will let you do it if they will let you set up lights and if you can find power. And, um, you know, we do have a few light kits you can check out. The question is, are you going to have time and do you want to carry around uh, a 40 pound light kit everywhere you go? Sometimes it's good. It's really good for interviews. And sometimes you're just going to bring the bare minimum. That, remember how I said you have the tripod in one hand, the camera in the other hand, and a backpack? Sometimes you can put a light and a tripod in that backpack and you can have a professional light that plugs in. So other times you're going to use natural light. You can still have a well lighted set. You can still think of it as, you know, created, constructed if you're working with the available tools. So that means no shadows across the subjects. You almost never use backlight. In a very rare occasion it, you, you want to uh, you want to have somebody uh, shot as a silhouette but I don't think you should be doing that for this class essentially. There's, there's really no reason to be doing that. Um, I, I say this, uh, it should be a whole lecture in and of itself, but basically when you show up to an event, you want to look before you even get the camera out. You want to look around and anticipate where the shots are going to be. You want to see it with your eyes first. If you don't see potential shots with your eye, you don't have to walk around like Ed Wood or something holding your fingers into a rectangle, but you do need to see shots before you set up the camera and it'll get to where you just recognize them. You just kind of will know, you'll just look at a scene, you'll just get there and look from left to right and you'll say, okay, I've got to get close ups of this, I've got to get wide shots of that, I've got to get shots of these people before they take off. I can go back to the example of a crawfish boil. Um, if there's only 10 people there eating, get shots of the people eating because they're going to disappear. Or if there's only five people in line, go get shots of people in line and then follow those people <laughs> to where they're eating. Um, you, you just have to anticipate what's going to happen. You have to imagine things uh, disappearing or dissipating. Scenes are going to just <laughs> vaporize in front of your eyes if you don't uh, move quickly. But it doesn't mean that you're uh, unable to set up <clears throat> shots by planning first. So use your eyes and let your eyes tell you where the shots are. And then go bring the camera to those places. SD card space is cheap. So when in doubt, shoot better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. The only thing I worry about is you shooting a four minute raw shot. If you have these really super long shots, it means you're not editing in the camera. You're not being judicious with your time and you're going to hate it when it comes to edit. And I'm not going to have any pity for you because I told you to hold shots for 10 seconds and we've, we've practiced hopefully with assignment one and assignment two shooting steady shots for a short amount of time and cutting them down to even shorter shots that add up to a sequence. So you got to watch out for this sort of flailing random. I turned the camera on and just pointed it at everything because we're not shooting birthday uh, parties. We're shooting professional video for, for news stories.